Hello everybody and welcome back to the Surge Podcast. So, um, it's been a while. Um, I realize this. There's been a couple of things going on. Uh, First off, I took some time off to start doing some teaching. uh, Online, uh, mainly, uh, for uh, exam prep and career guidance stuff and stuff like that. Um, I also have a couple of projects in the pipeline which I'm hoping to share with you on this podcast. And on other podcasts, I'll be collaborating with very soon, hopefully. And uh, I've basically been working on a new season. That's that's what I've been doing. Um, From the outset, uh, as you previously heard just now, uh, we have a a couple of changes coming up on the podcast. Uh, Mainly better music, I hope. Uh, Better mic quality, which I'm still working on, but it'll get better. My mixing skills aren't there yet. And uh, I'm hoping to get started on working on some brand new content, um, more interviews, things like that, uh, more open-ended discussions, but uh, that's in the pipeline. For today, uh, I wanted to cover a topic that sort of came up while I was giving teaching uh, to the Kuwaiti board residents. And um, I think the presentation is going to be online soon or something, not through my podcast, but through their own official channels. And uh, the thing that came up was, uh, pay mortem cesarean sections and trauma and you know I, I think it, it's it's a complicated topic and I think having seen it a couple of times um, it, it's it's very hard to do well and it's very hard to be slick with and it's it's a very traumatic situation for everybody involved uh, you know the family members the team members everybody and you know you hear about these cases and you hope that you don't have to see them and the reality of the situation is that when it's time to go, you have to go. And the reason why is because you have one shot, one decision-making process that has to save two lives. And that's the ultimate goal. Now, whenever I've seen these topics being discussed and whenever I've seen people talk about uh, sort of traumatic cesarean sections or peritraumatic um, emergency deliveries or things like this, and by traumatic, I mean trauma, as in a mechanism of injury of physical trauma, not the psychological trauma, which is a topic for another day. And what could argue is a topic that I might not be completely qualified to talk about, but I can give it a try. What I've seen, at least, with my own eyes, is most of these presentations, when they're given, you get this slide that says you have 24 weeks gestation, you have four to five minutes to take out uh, the uh, fetus and deliver the baby, and... That doesn't reflect reality. It doesn't reflect the fact that there's a transport time until the patient gets to you while they're agonal. Uh, that there's a downtime. That there's a fetal assessment that, that should be done at some point. That there isn't enough expertise available in any given hospital to be able to perform it well. And that you're trying to optimize outcomes particularly towards a certain mechanism. And unfortunately, trauma is underrepresented. It's underrepresented in the literature. Trauma is underrepresented in the perimortem cesarean literature. And it's underrepresented whenever I've seen people talk about it in in lectures and things like that. It's just not represented as much as I would hope or I would like. Or I think you would like too if you're you're in this situation. You do want to hear more about it and about the outcomes and how to maximize your outcomes particular to trauma. And, you know, that's why I'm doing this today. I'm not going to be talking about your standard picture that looks like this, because as we all know, we're going to do the midline laparotomy, and we're going to deliver the baby through a classical cesarean section and a lower segment cesarean section. We all know that this is what you're supposed to do. Whether you're a gynecologist or not, you know what you're doing. Whether you're an obstetrician or not, you know what you're doing when it comes to these things, because these are the only two slides that we typically get. We get the 24 gestation and 45 minutes in these things. We don't get enough discussions about the goals of therapy. The fetal and maternal goals. How to maximize survival. Because there are only three possible outcomes that you should hope for. The best outcome is fetal and maternal survival. The second to best outcome is fetal survival. And let's face it, it's unlikely after 24 weeks. Yes, we're revisiting this. Some of the people who I work with here in Kuwait, we've had discussions about this. And these are really high-level sort of black belts in in fetal maternal medicine. We've had these high-level discussions. 
where where they've posed an argument that makes sense to me that 24 weeks is a nice number to have but it may not be the only number in 2021 and then maternal survival and that's quite unlikely if your patient has a prolonged downtime with a, with agonal vitals or atonal vitals it's supposed to be agonal typo my bad and the reason why these things are so hard to strive for i find is because we've developed these barriers and these barriers are from the way that we're trained as physicians in general. So our emergency doctors are always trained to be able to handle resuscitation in the emergency room adequately. But they can't perform a lot of the technical skills required as a surgeon. Our fetal maternal specialists, our obstetricians, and our midwives are extremely adept at delivering a baby. If you have a patient with fetal distress, you should watch these guys work. It's like you're seeing ninjas. It's like us doing ED thoracotomies as trauma surgeons, right? They're very slick. And me as a trauma surgeon, I don't know how to what 24 weeks looks like. Well, I do, but I don't really, right? I do because I remember from medical school, but I'm not as adept or as confident as somebody who understands the technical and tactical barriers. And that's what I think makes us into experts. It's when we can recognize that in every given situation in trauma, at least this is, trauma is easy, I think, because it's a, it's a specialty that leans itself towards limitations, I find, right? It makes you understand your limitations very quickly, and it's quite humbling when things happen in front of you that quickly. And, you know, some people would argue, well, it's a single organ shock state. Well, those are people who just don't enjoy trauma. And it's okay if you don't enjoy trauma, but I do. And if you're listening to this podcast, I think that you might as well. And one of the things is, in trauma, we recognize very quickly when we have a situation where the tactical and the technical aspects lead to a problem and a barrier towards me providing optimal patient care. And what I find is the use of basic fundamental physiological building blocks like airway, breathing, circulation, do I need to intubate, do I need a chest tube, and do I need a central line, blood transfusions, etc., using those key tools in different combinations helps us overcome these barriers. And that's the next part that I'm going to talk to you about. So the, we're not going to be talking about your basic downtime five minutes, let's deliver the baby. We're going to be talking about how the technical and tactical barriers need to be broken down. What are our barriers? So the first is we don't have fetal maternal expertise in the ED. You could be the best emergency physician in the world. And Lord help me, I've worked with some pretty good people in my lifetime. I've been lucky enough. And I'm pretty confident in a resuscitation room. I still am not an expert at fetal, maternal, perimortem, cesarean sections. I am not. I've seen it. I've done it. But I'm not an expert. People don't know what to do after the rate-limiting step. That is delivery. They t kind of tend to jam up. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. And there's a failure to recognize that you're not dealing with postpartum hemorrhage. And you're not dealing with an obstetrical hemorrhage. You're dealing with a trauma hemorrhage, a fetal distress, and an obstetric problem that requires a neonatal ICU and more than likely will require an adult ICU bed to, an intensivist around. So you're dealing with an extremely high level of complexity here. All of a sudden, we went from five minutes, make the decision, 24 weeks gestation, deliver the baby, to now I have to think because there's more than one thing going on, right? And in general, one of the things that we need to understand is that in, in these cases, you have a, a, the identification as the thought process of a hemodynamically unstable trauma patient, okay? And my cutoff is once I see a systolic below 60, whether you're pregnant or not, a heart rate above 110, or a VBG from hell, I'm not even looking for fetal distress, I already know that this is a patient who may be a candidate for resuscitative maneuvers on the fly, okay? You're going to do some temporizing maneuvers, and during that temporization phase, you're probably going to end up having to coordinate the team, resuscitate, and start making that decision. And then you need to decide on delivery and fetal resuscitation while hemorrhage, damage, while hemorrhage control and damage control is happening. Now, the quickest pathway towards hemorrhage control is an ED thoracotomy. Yes, we have Reboa. And yes, ED thoracotomies are quite technically demanding. And there are debates happening all the time on how they really shouldn't be done or they should be done. I operate on a 1% doctrine. If there's a 1% chance that I can save a patient's life, 
I'm going to take that 1% chance in the emergency room with a young trauma patient, especially if they're pregnant. But I'm not going to clamp off their aorta before I have a delivery plan. Right? And that's the next step. But first, you need to realize you have a patient with a systolic of 60 and a heart rate of 110. You need to realize they're going to need to position them. You're going to need to intubate them. For sure. Now that you've decided on a delivery, on a perimortem cesarean, an intubation is happening. Whether agonal or not. You're going to optimize venous access because you're going to need blood, Lord help me. You're going to activate your teams. And the word is teams and not team. It's not just the trauma team. It's the trauma team. It's the fetal maternal team. It's the midwifery team. It's the NICU team. And it's the ICU team. You're going to give your antibiotics, your transexemic acid. You're going to prepare your MTP. You're going to wrap your pelvis, put your tourniquets on, and put in chest tubes. You're going to do everything that you can to temporize. While you're doing this and you're positioning your patient in that decubitus position, you're going to examine the patient to avoid certain sort of pitfalls. During that time period, you should already be planning to do CPR. Now, a lot of people like to use manual uterine displacement these days as opposed to a left lateral tilt. I personally have not found a preference for one or the other, and I can't claim an expertise for one over the other. I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Once you're at a certain gestational age, 23 to 26 weeks, it's hard to tell. As a rule of thumb, it's two centimeters above the umbilicus. The fundal height should be two centimeters above the umbilicus. Okay? A CTG is too late. An ultrasound is too late. You're not going to do an ultrasound in these patients. If your patient's systolic is persistently 60, they're going to rest faster than you think. You can give vasopressors. That's fine. But know that even with the vasopressors in the trauma literature, if it's a pure trauma problem and it's reversible, you're going to end up with a cardiac arrest situation while you're doing your ultrasound. Ultrasound and CTG really have no role in this situation. Okay? So long as you know that you're two centimeters above the umbilicus, you're a candidate for a perimortem cesarean, the patient gets one chance. One chance at resuscitation. The minute you're thinking of starting CPR is the minute that you're going to end up activating this plan for, uh, for a... A hemorrhage control team and a delivery team to be activated you can stay calm and you will be interacting very calmly with the specialties if they're not calm themselves however sometimes and this is very rare and I'm not saying that there's one specialty over the other a lot of people pretend that being calm and being confident are the same thing and they're not just because you walk in and you think that you have enough time to decide whether or not something should happen, and you've walked in five minutes after somebody else who supersedes you in that room has made that decision, does not mean that you should stay calm. Because despite what people think, this is not a single organ hemorrhage. This is not just a uterine problem. This is a multi-organ hemorrhage, and you aren't good enough. If you're an emergency doctor, you don't know enough about obstetrics. If you're a trauma surgeon, you don't know enough about how to run that ED. And quite honestly, trauma surgeons tend to be a little bit too aggressive in the ED in general, myself included, but sometimes it's worth it. And this might be one of those times where you want to be a little bit assertive. And if you're an obstetrician, you've never had to make the decision to do a crash laparotomy to deal with hemorrhage from multiple foci. It just doesn't happen. You don't have a ruptured spleen over a ruptured liver with a potential aortic injury. You just don't have that. We do. And, and, you know, it's tough. And it's underrepresented in the literature, and it's hard to believe. But nobody in that room can develop this expertise because it's so rare. And these pitfalls, we need to understand them. And we need to understand that the biggest pitfall is not one of these things. It's making sure that all the teams involved get working in under five minutes. You want this done in four minutes flat. Recognize this. So in trauma, we keep talking about the golden hour. And anybody who's worked in a busy ER, in a resuscitation room, knows. The golden hour is a rarity. A lot of the time, it takes a while to get that CT. It takes a while to transport patients. And one of the biggest problems is getting this done in four minutes. And here's why. What we tend to think is hemodynamically unstable. Call and coordinate your team. You did that perfectly. Your uh, patient's positioned correctly. And you just start your CPR and you call for the delivery. And what ends up happening is that we deliver and then we sustate the fetus. And that's it. And then we go, oh, there's blood in the abdomen in the mother. 
And now we have to do something about that. And then we switch to hemorrhage control mode. And then we decide we're going to do maternal damage control. And it's very rare that I've seen somebody make a decision to open the chest early. But that should be far more coordinated. And we should not have this afterthought error. It just should not occur. This afterthought situation should not occur. There should be two parallel teams involved, at least in my opinion. Having seen this happen more than once, there should be a team for delivery and fetal resuscitation. And a team that's getting ready to do hemorrhage control and more than likely an ED thoracotomy, a hemorrhage control team or a mother team. And there should be a trauma team leader coordinating both teams with the hemorrhage control trauma team dealing with the maternal anesthesia, ICU, and trauma surgical aspects, and the delivery baby team dealing with the initial obstetric delivery situation, the NICU situation, and transferring the patient over to a monitored setting. And there has to be a command structure here. And the command structure can only end when they're both in a monitored setting, if you want to optimize outcomes. Now, whenever you have this situation, it has to be divided into phases, where phase one is more than likely going to be you thinking about doing this thoracotomy, like we talked about. I'm going to keep repeating myself, because this is a very important aspect of things. You need to learn to trigger early for these things. You only have four minutes to deliver that baby. Five. Yes, you can extend it to 15 in certain textbooks, but in reality, it's five. You want to cover yourself, that's it. Your second phase is a unified approach where as the delivery is happening, the start of hemorrhage control is happening. And the third phase is the continued resuscitation of mother and baby. Whenever you're talking about these phases and the way that they have to be done, we really have to understand it's an ongoing process. You're going to have to think about all these things from the start. The minute you make that decision to go in from phase one onwards, phase two has to be thought of and put into place. And whenever you're doing these temporizing maneuvers and moving into phase two, recognize that phase two is all about two different things. Hemorrhage control in the, in the mother and the laparotomy at the same time. As the laparotomy is being performed, the chest should be opened or a reboa should be inserted. My preference is to open the chest in agonal patients. It's just what I've been trained to do and what I find com that I have some confidence in. And in our centers, the outcomes are better, not with maternal cases, but in general. We're just, Reboa is still not yet ready for prime time where I'm working right now, okay? As I'm opening the chest, the minute I hear clamped cord and the baby's delivered, as the trauma surgeon, I'm putting in my aortic cross clamp. You cannot clamp the aorta before the cord is clamped. And the key reason is because the baby will still need the circulation to an extent. And you don't, you want to maximize fetal outcomes while maximizing maternal outcomes. You don't want to sacrifice one over the other. Okay, so as my clamp is going on, the cord is being clamped. Once the baby is delivered, the uterus has to be packed. It is not the time to close the uterus. The abdomen has to be packed. And that's when you're moving to the operating room. And I can't emphasize this enough. You need to pack everything. So left upper quadrant, right upper quadrant, paracolic areas, and the pelvis itself. All right. The more you pack, the better. Do not attempt to close the uterus quite just yet. The patient is going to be in DIC. I know that there will be a lot of bleeding, but it's fine. For this moment in time, you already have an aortic clamp in place. Your patient should have a blood pressure back. And from then on, you're going for maximum hemorrhage control and continued resuscitation in the actual operating room. And from there, you can move on and move on to doing whatever you have to do, be it a splenectomy, etc., etc., which is beyond what, what we're talking about these days right however just a quick thing on that for phase three as we're going through our definitive resuscitation phase when you deliver the fetus expect that there will be a low apgar and bradycardia and make sure that your neonatologist understands this have a quick word beforehand you know usually i'm, I'm kind of planning for these things, like I can see it happening, the systolic's not picking up, and so I'll tell the NICU guys, patient's going to be bradycardic on the way out, like it's going to happen, right? And then, at the same time, you need to look at the mother to see whether you've achieved ROSC or not, whether you have return of spontaneous circulation or not. And if you do have return of spontaneous circulation, you're going to the operating room, damage control, temporary abdominal closure, while your NICU team is considering either an intubation or resuscitation with epi for the neonatal patient, okay? And eventually, they'll go to the NICU and to the ICU. 
it is imperative to understand this is a multifocal shock state at this point. This is not a pure ED obstetric gen surge ICU problem. This is a fucking shit show. All right? It's going to be difficult. It's not going to be easy. But you have to be able to have these thoughts in place. You have to understand, as a TTL, that you need to form two different teams. And I'm going to emphasize this again. If there's one thing that you should take home, it's this slide and the next one. Two different teams. The first team is to deliver the baby and resuscitate the baby, knowing that the baby will be bradycardic, may be hypoxemic, will have a low APGAR. Make it into an absolute in their heads. Get them ready mentally. At the same time, you have a damage control and hemorrhage team. This team should be ready to go to the operating room and should do their best to maintain spontaneous circulation in the mother. Ideal situation would be that you go to, to, to the OR eventually, okay? This can't wait for you to go to the operating room. This part of the resuscitation has to be done in the ER. I can't emphasize this. A lot of the time, what I keep hearing is, I tried to get to the operating room. I don't think that that's feasible. Because you only have four to five minutes based on the literature and based on physiological principles. And so I don't think that that's a viable notion, that you can get a patient to the operating room in an agonal state with a systolic of 60, because the fetus is not getting enough cardiac output. You're sacrificing the baby at this point. It really has to be imperative that we know that this is going to be an emergency room procedure. It's going to be a resuscitation room procedure. And this is going to be a multiple phase, multiple team procedure. And your TTL has to coordinate that. You cannot possibly attempt a delivery without a hemorrhage control plan and trauma. It just, I don't think that it's viable. If you think that, that, that that's viable, you're not going to get fetal maternal outcomes that are very, very optimized. Remember, we're vying for fetal maternal survival as our first goal. Second goal, fetal survival. Third goal is maternal survival. Remember, there is going to be some problems with fetal maternal expertise. We're not that good. No, no single specialty is that good at this. We all need to work together towards that goal of fetal maternal survival. We also need to know that the delivery is the rate limiting step, but that hemorrhage control and resuscitation of the fetus are primary, 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 absolute components of your plan as a resuscitationist. You need to recognize you are not dealing with trauma plus fetal distress. You're dealing with multifocal shock leading to fetal distress. And it's not going to be an isolated PQ, NICU, ICU, or obstetric, or ER, or gen surge problem. It's going to be an integrated problem, much like a lot of trauma. Uh, it's great to be back. Uh, thank you guys for uh, having me. I apologize. It's been a while. Um, hopefully, I'll come up with uh, better content uh, as the days go by. Um, this is Saud Al-Zaid signing off. Uh, music was uh, provided by Vinyl Destination, who have been awesome. Have a good day, guys. Thank you.